Uh, let's get started. Uh, today we are going to talk about dynamic loaded libraries outside the standard. Uh, during the talk, there will be um, a number of small sections. At the end of every section, I'm going to give you some time, uh, I, and I, uh, I'll ask, uh, answer questions. So, if you only see the title, you might be thinking this talk will talk about dynamic link libraries. So we must be familiar with these dynamic link link library formats. Is this this is this talk about dynamic linking? Not exactly. I'm going to give you some background about dynamic loading. So dynamic linking is not the same as dynamic loading. For uh, dynamic linking, this is a concept as opposed to static linking. Wherefore, uh, dynamic loading, it ask, uh, the aim is to ask for additional functionalities. Dynamic linking form a uh, physical aspect of the program. It's the same program with known functionalities, but divided into dynamic linked components. But for dynamic, dynamic loading, um, it often involves library discovery because we don't know the functionalities yet. Those functionalities may uh, live, uh, lie on the file system or may not even be on your OS right now. Uh, for both concepts, code relocation is needed to map the address specified in the library files to make them available in the process address space. So this pro uh, for dynamic linking, the relocation happens at load time. Yeah, it's finished before the first line of the program you wrote runs. But for dynamic loading, this, this, this happens at wrong time after the first line of your program runs. And in addition, uh, dynamic loading may be capable of, uh, the libraries that are dynamic loaded may be capable of unloading. So here's an interesting case, the NS bundle on a Mac OS. Older version of Mac OS did not ship DR open. They have a different file format, loadable modules called bundles, and those are not .dialib. They usually have the .so or .bundle file name extensions, and they do not support linking by passing the dash l lib file linker flag. Some deprecated APIs work with both uh, uh, can, can load link and unload bundles at runtime. But this talk is not about them. I can only tell you that they are all prefixed with the uh, uppercase NS. And the DL Open API, which is introduced later, works with both dynamic, uh, dynamic libraries and bundles. And one more thing, period to Mac OS 10, DL Close does not um, unload dynamic libraries. So as you can see, the dynamic linking and dynamic loading may not be even using the same file format. In case you don't know, uh, the, these are the executable and link, uh, linkable file formats being used on different platforms. On Windows is PE, on um, Unix and Unix-like OS, this we have ERF, and Mac has Mac O object file format. The dynamic loading libraries are materially the same as executable, uh, materially the same executable and linkable formats. But applications can architect them for different needs. For example, the Apache HTTP module, those are DSOs certainly, um, and you can load them by using the load module directive in the uh, config files. C Python C extensions are also customized modules. They have their uh, .pyd file name extension on Windows. If you uh, do an import followed by module name, you get the new module in the Python language. A different method of doing this is JNI, Java Native Interface. What JNI is doing is that uh, you write C functions following 
a specific file naming convention. And at the time you do system load library, those C functions automatically fulfill the rule of the Java methods. So here is a sample loadable library. Uh, in this example, I'm creating a, a dynamic loadable library to do reproducible math, uh, floating point math. And you can see that here are some special macros, and those are generated by CMake. So to create such a library in CMake, uh, you can do a library library name and use the module keyword, and then use the generate export header on this target. And that is how you get this uh, export header, which includes those macros to export them. Uh, this is the header, and here are the dynamic loading APIs on Fin32. So we have load library EX, which opens and load, uh, open a handle, uh, get, get a handle to a library. Uh, this is just an overview. We will come back to all of every one of these APIs later. So dynamic li a load, a load library followed by your library name. It's same functionality, but uh, but it searches for default Dell directories, and then the get proc address. Uh, you get the address to the entities. Note that this does not need does not only get the procedures address, you also get the variables address. And then free library, it unloads the library. Last but, on, but not least, get last arrow. If all, any of these APIs above encounters an arrow, you can get the last arrow using this function. So the command to check out what symbols are exported. We have dumping slash export. It can show you the export name and also give you a summary of all the name functions and variable names have been exported in this style. How to use the whole thing? Um, because this is a floating point mass library, I declare some factors, load the library, handle arrows, and then uh, here's a trick I often use. Many people are confused by the function pointer declaration syntax. The method I use is that I simply first declare a function, right? This is a function declaration, and then prepend type diff in front of it. At that time, you got a uh, function type called d dot underscore t. And then at the time, you need to use the pointer to function type at a star to, at the, to the end of the type. They got it. So in this case, I'm resolving the symbol that I previously found using dumping, using get proc address in this lib, and, and then cast the address to the pointed function. So now I have a pointer to the function in the lib, and then I can use it after using it free all the library, free the library. So this is a Win32 API example. Here is the uh, API on post 6 DR open, um, very similar. It opens and gets a handle to the library. DR scene, also similar. And then uh, DR close. It clo uh, this is slightly different because it closes the simple table handle. It may unload the library. The exact behavior is implementation behind, uh, defined. And this is uh, also interesting, DL arrow, it gives you directly to the arrow string instead of some arrow noun. Because this functionality is served by a, uh, a dynamic loaded library, LD does so. To check out what symbols are exported on Unix, we have obj dump dash t. This, uh, there are actually lots of other commands can do this, but this command is EIF only. And I found this information is very detailed. So how to use it on POSIX? We have the same program, about the same procedure, same declaration, same cast, same way of use, and then unload the libraries, they are close. Um, one last, uh, the last thing before we get into 
the actual use cases. Loaded libraries are reference content. So uh, previously I mentioned all these APIs. Um, they are open load library and load library EX increments the reference count, and they are close and free library decrement the count. So those two functions only may load unload the library uh, only when the reference count drops to zero. And there's an actual insert to do API get module handle at EX. It can increment the reference count of a loaded module. Uh, so far, questions? Uh, the question is, in one of the example, should I uh, should should that API be used as load library exw and followed by the white string uh, white string text? Yes, but uh, um, the load library ex is their um, tchar macro name, so I'm just using the shorthand way to write it. Yes, there are different versions, W and A for white character and ASCII. Q and A, the Mango name would change across different compiler version. Um, not recently. <laughs> it hasn't been changed for many years. But yes, that's a right concern. So. Let's get into the use cases. So that's all the basics we need to know. Um, now we discuss the use cases that rely on different levels of dynamics, uh, a different level of dynamic. The level zero, dependent libraries. Here are the commands to show the dependent libraries of an executable or a, a dynamic library. So to explain why there is such a term, dependent library, uh, let me recall what static linking is doing. If we don't use any library to build an application, we just compile every translation unit, get object file, uh, gather them together, extract all the symbols, and then we get an application. But if we use static library and do static linking, linking uh, for instead of directly gather those translation units, we archive them in different static libraries and then extract the symbols from the static library. We build the application. So it's the same application. But for dynamic linking, we materialize those uh, static libraries into the file libraries we need to load at when the program runs. So those symbols are externalized into libraries. The application only need to record its dependency. That is why it is called dependent libraries. So the dependent libraries, its prime rule is to decompose the application's material for shipping. They are dynamic in terms of the exact component to, components to load not a dynamic in terms of all the rest. Uh, the dependencies are established at build time by the linker. And the actual linking happens before the program runs its first line of code. That's why it's also called load time dynamic linking. Uh, dynamic linking is similar to static linking at least to the GCC and the client tool chain's default visibility. And also, C++ abstracts, abstract machine can be implemented on top of dependent libraries, but not all the dependent libraries can do fit into a language. So at this level, we are not actually outside the standard yet. Let's get a little bit more dynamic. Delay loading. With delay loading, um, we load a dependent library only when referencing the first name in it. It's more, in this way, the application is more dynamic in terms of the timing of a load its dependencies. And it's often used for when improving application startup time. Is delay loading available cross-platform? Sort of. On Windows, 
uh, you can link uh, link a helper library called delay input dot lib and use the link uh, pass the link option slash delay load followed by your uh, library file. On Solaris, you can use the link option dash z lazy load followed by your regular link of X. On Linux, there is a DAI solution. You can search for implip.so on GitHub. It's a dial like import library for POSIX. And this library uses DR open. It's an example of um, solving a problem that could be solved with the linker change using DR open. Um, another famous example about this um, convention is simple namespace, where Bing32 don't have the problem. Mac OS introduced the two-level namespace, but for glibc, they hand you over a new API called DRM open so that you can introduce your own namespace. Um, so about delay loading, let's try it with MSBC. So this is uh, my previous example, but I modified it to print the address of the function I'm about to use before using it and the address of the function that I used after using it. What's going to happen? Well, the address of the function changed. This is because the implementation involves replacing some functions, so that's the Solaris linker. So here comes the surprise of delay loading. The address of the function may change at the wrong time because the address of the thunk is not the same as the address of the actual function. Now let's pause a little bit and think about how bizarre this situation is. The objects in C++, their point, the pointers, their address do not change. Because in C++ object model, the or the objects cannot be relocated in memory. So if you if you recall C++ CLI where they introduce the uh, their GC pointer type like T caret as opposed to C++ T star, this is because modern garbage collector want to move objects in memory, but C++ objects doesn't allow it to do it. So now the situation is the objects do not relocate, but the functions do. Questions so far? Um, the question is, the question is very long. It talks about uh, the link library get relocation resolved at low time. Um, but uh, the comment says that on Linux, dynamic linked functions are not resolved uh, uh, during Long time. I'm not very sure. What I know, what I heard is that the names are re not resolved during wrong time, but the address may be mapped early, and that's called relocation. I'm not very sure about this part. Uh, that's a uh, something nice to be diving into. Okay, let's continue. Uh, how? <laughs> the second level, foreign linkage modules. Let's take a closer look at the dynamic loading APIs. So we have a uh, thing which returns a pointer to void. It's a pointer to object. And then we cast, into, cast it into a pointer function. Now comes the question, can a pointer of type void star be casted to a pointer of function? The short answer is maybe. Uh, converting a function pointer to an object pointer type or vice versa is conditionally supported. But the POSIX standard requires this to work correctly on confirming implementations. So they probably never thought about it. What about Vincer 32 The get proc, address, uh, proc address returns far proc. Well, that's this time, this is a pointer to function. So not bad. Uh, a pointer, uh, a function pointer can be explicitly converted to a function pointer of a different type. But this doesn't mean that we can safely use it. Calling a function through a pointer to a function type that is not the same as the type used in the definition of function, the behavior is undefined. 
So here comes a question. To call this, this defined or undefined, we have a pointer to which function? Here comes the surprise of dynamic entities. The result of resolving symbols at runtime points to functions that are foreign to the program or objects that are foreign to the object mode. Why do I use the term foreign here? So let's recall volatile. A variable declared volatile is outside the abstract machine, so it's outside the object model as well. We don't have an idea about such an object's uh, lifetime. We don't know when it's born or when it's gone. If that explanation is still too foreign to you, how about uh, trying to understand this? If we are using a function defined in a different language, that's of course a foreign function function interface. Here's an example of FFI in Python C types. So this is this uh, program is almost identical to previous to the previous C plus plus program, um, with one exception that is if you omit this line this line, you'll get garbage, uh, or the program can crash. I have been maintaining a library that exclusively uses C-types, and we encounter crashes. Almost all bugs are about crashes, because we are not, we were not protected by the type system. FFI won't be strongly typed as well, and there are existing um, solutions to this. For example, we have PyBind 11, which allows you to write C++ code that sets up the module in Python. And JMA, you can declare C functions using Java programmer. And ultimately, there is a Dragon FFI. You can declare C or C++ functions in you know, C++. Here's an example. In this example, um, we use DL open to load the library, and we include the DL. This is, uh, includes the header. And immediately we get access to this. Note that the archive read new function is a C function exported from lib archive. So you know what? C++ is not dynamic loading. C++ libraries better than other languages. For me, I believe C++ should be able to get this level of convenience. That is, uh, for by using a concept for in linkage. We, to do dynamic loading, we can include the header, open the library, and then, then use some magic to resolve not a symbol, but a declaration from the library. To resolving dynamic entities using declarations, it has lots of benefits because declaration decides the symbol of the entity. It includes everything can possibly affect name mangling, name type, language linkage, attributes, and potentially vendor-specific extensions such as ABI tags. The idea is not new. It also presents in a paper, uh, a 2006, 2006 paper. Getting more dynamic plugin systems. What happens if two loadable libraries define the same entity? Well, after loading all libraries, if we view the whole program in memory as a C program, that's an ODI violation. Although it happens at wrong time. In real world, all mainstream platforms made efforts to mitigate the risk. But those mechanisms are mostly defensive, usually not meant for being used as a new abstraction above the language. I'm going to explain this part later. So at least to the, mo the modules with foreign linkage, simple, uh, simple conflicts are accidental to those entities. What two implementations of OpenSSL can't do anything good in the same process? And we also have the term ABI compatible. The term itself already implies that we want the functionality to be substitutable. But what if we use the same ABI to programmatically get extra functionalities? Here is an example, GGL, generic graphic, graphic uh, libraries from GIMP. So if you look at its directory, you're going to see this. 
Well, it's very obvious that voice functionality is about some file type is categorized as save and load. So for example, for PNG, we know that GEGL can load and save, but for SVG, it can only load. In other words, you can achieve adding removing functionalities by drag and drop files. So how to achieve something like this? If you search the internet, and you may find some articles introduce a typical plugin architecture in C like this. You declare some functions to create and destroy the plugin. So uh, you would also declare another set of functions to work with the plugin, and maybe run the plugin. And then in uh, plugin 1, we implement these functions. And in plugin 2, we implement uh, these functions again. Now. We got side by side definitions. That's multiple definitions to the same entity. In principle, would you have violation? But table this a little bit. Let's continue to finish how they run the example. The next step, we prepare the types for get proc address. We declare all the uh, functions we implemented uh, as pointer functions and how to use them. We, uh, we need to load all the library from the file system. So we have a function called load all plugins. We declare local variables for all these functions, uh, pointer functions. And then in a while loop, we uh, load the plugin, resolve all the addresses. And finally, those addresses will be assigned somewhere, maybe stored somewhere. Because otherwise, if every function called to the library involves a get proc address, we are turning every function call into a hash table lookup like some dynamic type language did. We are not doing that. We are going to assign every plugin's function pointer to some struct like this. You know, this type, this type is a pointer to this struct. Now, what's this? It's a V table. So please, don't do that. The ask is to provide different implementations to the same set of functions. And the answer in C++ is simply a table. Here's an example of, plugins, of a plugin system in C++. We create a CMIC interface library called where is Python. Python. So to give you a little background about what I'm trying to do, nowadays we have lots of Python installed on one box. Right. They, are, uh, they may be installed using a full installer, maybe coming from Microsoft Store, maybe using Conda, maybe you installed, uh, may, they may be uh, active Python distributions. So what I'm trying to achieve is that um, we run a executable. It's able to find all the Python installations given a specific version by listing all the possible uh, uh, installers. So uh, we have the CMake interface here. It's called uh, Wax Python, and we introduce the CMake module library. Uh, actually, two of them. First is uh, the full installer, which gives you the Python official installer's answer, and the next one is gives you the uh, Python installed from Microsoft Store. And finally, an executable uh, to use an from the interface. So let's take a look at what the interface do. Where is Python? Uh, the where is Python in the header and namespace, we declare a uh, installation abstract uh, base class uh, and with two member functions to uh, return where the python.exe and python.w.ext comes. And then we declare a factory interface by looking, so you pass a specific Python version such as 3.8 here, it's supposed to return you a unique pointer of the given kind of installation. And for the in, full installer implementation, we have uh, install and the same namespace. This implementation is done by looking up the Windows registry, very simple. And for its factory, we look, we try look up and try to make unique of the instance. If failed, we just say, oh, there's no such installation. 
and at a, at four installers there at at the global namespace, we define an instance to the factory and then export it as namespace uh, as instance. Uh, so to demangle it. So similarly in Microsoft Store in, uh, installer. To show the flexibility of this solution, this DL is a C plus plus CRI project. I'm looking for Microsoft. Uh, I'm looking for the Python installed from Microsoft Store using uh, C plus plus CRI package PowerShell. And very similarly, uh, we define an instance of its uh, factory and export it. Note that uh, with MSBC, you can also use the dev file if you don't like to use vendor specific. Um, Pragmas. Now, about how to load them into as plugins. Uh, plugin .h namespace, plugin demo. Uh, we define a plugin by parameterized using the factory uh, abstract base class type. Uh, we store a handle and store a pointer to the factory. And in its constructor, we initialize, well, we load the library from the, the path to the library on the file system. And then uh, we resolve it immediately and get the address of its instance. Note this line, what is this doing? So I'm now in an executable, not linked to the library, right? The instance is defined as instance in each implement, uh, in each Dell so it may be for installer uh, .dell or Microsoft .dell. So in this example, the type of the instance is where it's Python for installer factory. And that it, its address is of type for installer factory star. The, we, all the plugins, we are going to have the specialization plugin where it's type factory which is the uh, uh, abstract base class type. So this conversion is entirely legitimate in C++. The next step is to iterate over the file system to get all the, plug, uh, all the plugins. So this function, open plugins, you look for all the plugins on the directory and return a vector of all of them. So in the map function, here's how we use it. For each plugin under the current working directory, we look up for a specific Python version, print is executable and window executable. That's it. So here's the demo of uh, looking up for version 3.7. Note that the first set of the first two lines are installed using the Python official installer, and the second two lines are coming from the uh, Microsoft Store. So if you delete the full installer.dell, you lose the first set of answers. If you rerun this program, if you delete the Microsoft Store.dell, you lose the second set, set of answers. So we achieved plugging by drag and drop files. To summarize the surprise seen um, in a plugin architecture, plugins do want to violate the one definition rule in principle, uh, but not necessarily on functions. And having control over alias exported for loading purposes will help. Will help. For example, for um, the ASM uh, deco specifier in GCC and Clan, it can uh, nail down the name exported in the binary. Questions so far? So uh, the first question is, I used the uh, a directly defined API as um, a external signature that refers to a Win32 API by using the AMS, ASM um, uh, directive so that we don't need to include Windows.h. Then cast it to a function pointer I need to use. Is this undefined behavior? Um, it's outside the standard. <laughs> I cannot say whether it's undefined behavior. It's not. It's just not a part of standard. 
And that might be a good uh, direction of standardization also, this trick. Another question is, dots of C APIs front ends are not marked as no except. How do I, uh, if I use an C++, how could I avoid binary load with them? Well, that's a problem with no except, to be honest. I, I'm, um, I don't think this is uh, need to couple with this talk, which talks about the uh, dynamic loading. Sorry, I don't know what this comment is. What's a good way to share data between plugins? Mm, there are lots of definitions of what does sharing data mean here. I'm not quite sure. You can expand this a little more later. Okay, if there are no more questions, we need to continue. So, live updates. So, recall a typical plugin system. You don't want to unload, so like this is GEGR, right? You don't want to unload any of this when GIMP is running. You might argue that if a plugin encounters trouble, Maybe I want to unload it. Well, you might expect <laughs> rebooting a computer solves all problems, but that doesn't apply to dynamic loading libraries for the reasons we'll talk about later. Um, but in some, at some time, you do want to unload old code, which may become insecure at the moment. And in a critical system that cannot be stopped, um, you do need to inject a new, new, new implementation on the fly. But there's a problem. If you unload a library, calling a function using a function pointer that points to a function in an unloaded library incurs access violation. So the fun part is that if we support unloading a library, now functions can be gone. Functions can be dead. In other words, function has lifetime. That's my, that might be why unloading is often, often avoided in the industry. For example, HTV servers, the modules cannot be unloaded. For Python's module system, it cannot unload Python C or C++ extensions. The usual in the directive to unload uh, Python modules in polyp.reload, that doesn't work on, uh, that doesn't reload the extensions. And sometimes even leave C refuse to implement unloading. Muscle deep is the closest no op. And they have reasons to do so. For example, for servers, relaunching the process solves our problem. For Python, it's better than violating the language rule. If leave uh, the live objects created from extensions do not keep the extension alive, that violates the language rule. But if they do, that's too costly. For Muscle Libc, they list the reason on their website because allowing DRClose to unload the library complicates the thread local storage implementation. I will explain both problems later. So about the first problem, in terms of uh, object model, can objects from a library outlive the library? If your lifetime is nested, no problem. If the objects can escape, well, there, there might be solutions. For example, we may let every object hold a strong reference to the factory object, or maybe let, let the library track all objects, or, well, this is too long, don't read. Uh, the only interesting part is this uh, API I mentioned before, get module handle EX. It can increment the loaded module's reference count by one. Note that OpenSSL uses API to prevent itself from being unloaded. As I said, unloading is often avoided in the industry. So, and then the problems about unloading. Oh, sorry, 
there is something wrong with the okay. And the problem can about unloading can go on and on. For example, if a thread may outlive the library, you may need to read a uh, uh, the another insert to API called the library and access thread. So in the end, you will find yourself implementing a pull man's GC. Functions now has lifetime. This fact is not the only language rule that the library unloading can break. The last issue of uh, Muscle really talked about the thread local storage. Let's take uh, let's get into that to see what's the problem here. So <laughs> when unloading a library, um, the vendors do something to give some semantics to the library. What they do is that when loading a library, we initialize the object with static storage duration and namespace scope. And when unloading a library, we destruct the objects with static storage duration. Um, as a kind reminder, the loaded libraries are reference content. Now, here comes the thread local, how to interact with it. So in ideal, ideally, when a thread starts, we initialize the object with thread storage uh, duration and name sp space scope, and when a thread exit, it construct pro uh, objects with thread local storage. Now here comes the dark zone. What happens if the library is unloaded before a thread exit? The problem is so bizarre because if you still remember, functions now have lifetime, so destructors also have lifetime. If destructor code is unloaded from a process address space, how to run destructors? In C++ previously, we don't have the problem because thread lifetime is naturally nested to the process lifetime. So let's run a quick test to see how vendors deal with this issue. Uh, similar to previous example, but let's get rid of all the details, just have a uh, logger interface and then a singleton to return the logger. The logger implementation memory logger uh, holds some memory resource and in its constructor and destructor we uh, log some message to the console. The instance of this logger will be thread specific. To make sense of thread specific we just return a reference to it uh, from the uh, memory locker singleton instance. Here you notice that there's a new macro being introduced and that macro just expands to some platform specific tricks to export the variable without mangling. So mm -hmm. the execute post man, to test this, the execute post man function, it just loads the library, just one of it, and then runs on threads, Join all the threads. The threads being used in the library for thread zero, we um, it starts by getting a reference to the thread specific logger instance, and then uh, the first line of thread one runs and immediately unloads it. After thread one un unloads the uh, uh, plugin, both threads now should run their thread specific objects destructor, right? Recall what our thread specific locker did. We mentioned that he locks some information. Here, here are the log lines he puts. When uh, a thread is attached to the uh, library, we print plus sign followed by thread thread ID. When it's detached, we print minus sign thread, log, uh, thread ID. Now see what's going to happen. For MSVC on Windows 10, that's what it prints. So that doesn't match. Where's the this there should be two call to the destructor. Miss a call to the destructor also means that we leak the memory address we uh, memory resource we acquired in the our memory locker, right? That's a leak. 
is Linux doing anything better? Yeah, sort of. But don't you feel that that's too good to be real? Let's investigate a little more. This time, we also lock static objects activities. And this is our unmodified fun uh, main function. Now, we load it one more time after all thread access. Note that after all the threads joined, the uh, plugin is supposed to be unloaded because our ref its reference count drops to zero. So this load should print uh, process attached, process detached, right? And on MS uh, for MSVC on Windows 10, that's expected. You know, it leaks, but has the right semantics. For GCC plus GLibc on Linux, <laughs> well, that looks weird. It looks like the static variables are not reinitialized. But what actually happened is, is there is a flag uh, for the shared object loaded using DR open. Uh, the flag is no delete. It do not unload, it prevents the shared objects being unloaded when you call DR close. Consequently, the object's static and global variables are not reinitialized if the object is reloaded with DR open at a later time. And to implement a proper thread local semantics, <laughs> What the uh, GDBC decided to do is they flag no delete on the DSO until all those thread local objects are destroyed. So, in short, they are closing the middle of destructing thread local objects is a no op. You can, uh, after all this is finished, you can call DR closely again to unload the DSO. But at that time, uh, it's equivalent to having necessary lifetime. So necessary lifetime is still required for reloading. To summarize the surprises of unloading, our functions may have lifetime. And implementations need to prevent objects with thread storage duration from outliving their destructors. Questions so far? Oh, there's a question. Do shared libraries really share code among different processes? Particularly ASLI might make things harder, right? Um, it's not guaranteed, but as far as I know, all um, for Windows, they do, although it has ASLI because it has a, the operating system manages um, the ASLR, the binaries in its address space and map it to different addresses. For uh, Mac OS, I'm not sure, this, is, this part is still evolving. Um, they, current, they are currently on the air open version 2.0 and in one of the webinar they had, they uh, said that they want to push the open um, version 3, which has a separate process to manage this. Let's get back to the link leaking issue with MSVC on Windows. How to diagnose it? Diagnose it. So fortunately, we have tools. So application verifier. Um, it has a UI that allows you to turn on runtime checks on executables to flag issues when specifically when they are on loads. And after being flagged, those executables then can stop the debugger. If you run them outside the debugger, they can, uh, they can cause a crash and give you a dump. And after being flagged, we can then use uh, bin dbg or bin dbg preview to link into the causes. Here, here is the uh, application verifier UI. So in this example, I um, added my application and turned on the basic checks. The basic checks includes um, handle leak, TRS leak, and memory leak. And when we run it in WinDBG preview, 
the app verifier stops you when the DAO is unloaded and tell you that you already the highlighted sentence or I tell you that run the DPS address command to view the allocation stack trace. And we do it. Here's the allocation stack trace. Where's the um, where the leaked memory come from? And if you notice that in this this line, right, this is a constructor of our memory logger and followed by a link. If you click on the link, it's going to pop up a new window, point to point you to the exact location where the allocation happened. Let's continue the talk. So to summarize the talk, uh, dynamic load, dynamically loaded libraries are also standard, but they are useful. We see lots of use cases, such as delay loading, uh, name uh, link with entities with foreign linkage, which requires explicit loading and loading uh, entities with multiple definitions, and then live updates, which requires unloading. As you can see, the more dynamic our use cases are, they are all outlier compared to standard. So they are useful, but fortunately, it's practical to create usable abstractions within our major platforms, given platform specific guarantees and vendor specific extensions. And I believe some standardization would add type safety and portability to those, those use cases. So um, all the examples are, can be found on my GitHub repository. Uh, why dr dash examples and they are runnable. Uh, questions? I do not want to file system pass in their proposal. Uh, why is there such a comment? It blows for 800 kilobytes by introducing uh, IO stream in the library. Which may be true. Um, maybe modules can help. <laughs> uh, this, is not a, this talk is not a proposal. I'm just drafting whatever I found convenient that makes sense. And I, yeah, I do think um, uh, also strictly speaking, the 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 their names, the library names, are not exactly passes. They are in some situations they are passes, of course, but in some situations they go through a finding process. So if we really comes to a proposal, these parts of course need to be carefully designed. Uh, any more questions? Mm, let me see. I sort of understand the previous question now. Like, what's a good way to share data between plugins? So, uh, I think the answer is that the the memory allo dynamically allocated from one plugin is useful in a another plugin. And it is true because the, their, their library code uh, are leaving different namespaces, but they still share uh, the process's address space, so it's still accessible. these if no other questions I think that's the end of the talk thank you for coming